Okay. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Belgium ambassador and his wife. Thank you for coming. And you all here, uh, coming in such numbers. So what we're going to do is going to go as follows. Since we have at least four of the seven living artists here, they can also say something about their work, which I think would be interesting to hear it firsthand. Uh, I'm going to say something really general about the show and talk about specific works, of course, and why the show came about and what it actually means uh, to me and what it also probably means to a couple of the artists and to Siba and her uh, parasol unit. And then we, we d then you can go upstairs because if we we're also going to talk the already about the works upstairs because otherwise if we have to meander all the way up with so many people that's going to be difficult I think. So, so the gap why a show about abstraction? When I was asked by Siba to organize a show about painting, I had the idea to make it a little bit more interesting in terms of just showing new painting propositions or find interesting painters and also to do something with a little touch of the a little historical touch like a mini museum show in a sense and for a long time I mean although I am a painter that works with figuration and it's departing from already existing imagery uh, which is referential and which I rework uh, that doesn't mean I don't like abstraction I mean I've always had a very sweet tooth for people like Mondrian, Ad Reinhardt, Ryman, Ellsworth Kelly, which is actually also a friend of mine. And in that sense, there is a reminiscence. It's just that I think the position of the type of abstraction that I'm showing here is very personified. All the positions are different positions from different point of views, from different artistic practices. If we start with the beginning, you're in front of a piece which is actually made by an uh, artist duo, which is Stefan Schrane and Kala Arocha, and also Philip van Snick, which is actually the oldest living artist in the show. Both are not, the three are not here, which is quite interesting because it's sort of like uh, presence in absence. It's also a work that goes over the two floors and was specifically made for this space and this show. What you see is a representation with which the colors were picked by Philip van Snick, who is an artist who's been working with the concept of abstraction, but also night and day. So the space downstairs is day, the space upstairs, which has a sm somewhat smaller ceiling, uh, is night, in a sense. Then behind me, there is a the work from, actually, I think those, those are the oldest works in the show. It's uh, Gaston Bertrand, I think this is from 60, 62, and the other one is from 54. Gaston Bertrand, was not an unknown person in London because he was also a person who was quite an organizer of abst abstract shows or works with, abst with abstract uh, artists. And there is even, I think you can still find some material in the British Library here in London. What is interesting is that these people, Gaston Bertrand, Jeff Ferrari, which you will see upstairs, or also Amédée Cortier, which is in the beginning, which we can maybe peep around the corner if you'd like, uh, and, and look at that, uh, are people that, of course, were at the forefront of avant-garde. I mean, they were no strangers to people like uh, Fontana, Manzoni, and also, of course, the Zero Group. Also, Walter Leblanc, which is upstairs, clearly having worked from a departure of optical art, uh, and also the reminiscence to the idea, a little bit of South American art, if you think of Luis Diaz and Soto. So all these influences come together, which is interesting because we come from a very small country, but there are a lot of interests and a lot of positions, which is typically Belgium. Belgian people are great as individuals. They're pretty, pretty bad as a group. Uh, in, in that sense, there is a nice, there's going to be one a nice text which will be written for the catalog in, uh, in, uh, by Ken Pratt, where he says, of course, it's abstract because Belgium is abstract. I mean, don't forget, Belgium was created in 1830, so it's a very young country. Uh, but anyway, that, that on the side. So all these positions are actually trying to think and look at abstract art from an operational point of view, like the work of Carla Stefan and Van Snick becomes operational because it includes the colors and works with the space, and also the work of, for example, the artist like uh, Raoul de Keyser, because this work is a work from 1971, a freestanding linen box. It's actually 
it has to do actually with it's, it's a bit of football field. Raul de Kaiser during his lifetime was also a reporter, a sports reporter. And the other works, because that's 71, and the other works of Raul, the ones you see behind there, are much recent, m much more recent. I think that one is from 97, the other one is from 2003. Most of the artists in the show I've known personally, except Gaston Bertrand, Gilles Verheyen, and uh, Amédée Cortier. Uh, so that, but all the others I've, I've known personally, talked to them, and had a sort of relationship with. In, there are also pairings in the show, or at least comparisons. And if you see the work of Raoul, Raoul's work is clearly, and this is actually also for most of the artists, also another, another artist and his wife is here, the artist Bernd Lohaus, who made sculptural propositions in the space, which are in the front when you came in, which you saw. Who also works sometimes with text, which is not the case in these works, because they are free compositional positions that you actually can uh, mobilize and put in the, a certain constellation you would like to put them. I also, they also have an element of, of, of abstraction, but they also have an element of the real. And I think what is important for Belgian art is that one should never forget that when one thinks about Belgium, there are two names that always crop up, which is like René Magritte, which is perceived as surrealism, which he was not, and James Ensor, which is perceived as grotesque and out of this world. He was a clear predecessor, of course, of expressionism, all by his own. So in that sense, one forgets that Belgium art actually deals with the real, with realism. And in that sense, there's an element of concreteness which you can see in every work in this show that comes back and therefore the abstraction is also an abstraction that's been experienced and in that sense translates. That is also the case with Raoul de Kaiser. You clearly know from fact that we talked and that we had a relationship that a lot of the abstraction comes from out his visual experience and perception. The same goes for an artist like Gertrude Bynes who makes actually, there's one wall behind where you see the coat and actually goes through the wall, you see a constellation in the corner of objects that come out of the house of his, grand, of, of, of his grandparents and are put in a constellation which sort of like displaces them in the space and therefore makes an abstraction from it. So there are clearly different elements. I also think to show abstraction just in a formalistic way would be actually boring. It would not be able to reactivate it. What's also really important, and this is why the title is The Gap, is that we're talking about two different generations. Two ge different generations who, like for sure, people like Gaston Bertrand, and some of them may, of course, know them of these younger artists, and some do, and others may not, but there was no clear link, in a sense. Now, if you look at the work of Jeff Verheyen upstairs, where you see works from the 70s, and I think one from the 60s, a dark painting, which is an element of a dark room. He also made a larger dark painting, which we didn't get from the Museum of Fine Arts in Antwerp, which is a bit uh, bigger, which was made in the 50s, actually at the same period of time as Ad Reinhardt made it, from probably different reasons. But if you see the paintings that he makes with degradés, there is a clear linkage to Peter Vermeers, in a sense. Whereas Peter Vermeers, and also, Jeff Verheyen had a clear definition and a fascination with light. Light and time. Time is also an, a specific element. I mean, the marble piece of Peter Vermeers and, which is a hard structure on which you have a soft structure, which is the paint, the paint as a marker in a sense, and then the very even, nearly perfect surface of what you could perceive as sky, or an envir uh, environmental or atmospheric image of abstraction that goes in several layers because these layers are minutely painted. This also comes back in a different form, in a form that is even more polished, which is even more about perfection in the work of Boy and Eric Stappard. And actually, when, this, when we were unpacking this work and hanging it, Boy told me, this is Boy here, that it's clearly based on old masters. That's what you said, right? So that the, you have the blue for the sky, you have the red for the garments, you have the beige for the color of skin, and why did you have the last ones? Also for the color of the skin or the contrast. 
because one should, of course, not forget we come out of the country of Jan van Eyck, which is the most unforgiving painter of, e of all and probably the best painter in the Western Hemisphere anyway. So fuck Leonardo da Vinci. So in that sense, this show, and this, is the, this was the clear departure point. This was also my interest in order to create that situation. There is a beautiful work of Guy Mays upstairs, which also unfortunately died suddenly, which I knew very well because I worked with him at the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam. Beautifully sensitive uh, work that is actually also to a point, there is an element of sensuality in it, which I think is also yet another point that in, in this, this, this group of works and these artists and also a specific thing that has to do with my home country is the element of the, physic the physicality of things and the understanding of that physicality within the real and it's all done with a specific way, a specific attention and uh, these, these things are important, like for example also the work of the youngest artist which is Timothy Zegers, who deals with metal sheets, metal sheets which are put on magnets which you can move up until the last moment of installation or the circular forms that are framed upstairs. They also move, you turn them until they fit in, uh, in their situation. Uh -huh. So, and I don't see it as an, as an abstraction. When you bring it into life, then you replace it, then it becomes a function. So this is real. Yeah. Okay. But maybe maybe we'll, we'll, we'll ask uh, Geert, for example, too, because in front of his work to just say something. I'm maybe going to make it more dynamic. Yeah. Okay. Um, you just describe. Maybe we have to see first those two pieces or what you saw in the entrance space. It is, for one hand, the jacket of my grandfather, and for the other hand, a kind of sm small jacket of my grandmother. Uh, those two things uh, are like two figures which were important for another project that I'm making now in Belgium. Uh, last year, my grandmother went to uh, a house, a rest house, and um, out of that fact came that uh, the family would uh, sell the property. And uh, I bought her house not only to keep the house uh, close to me, but to make a project out of that. So what I did was that I making a sculpture out of her house, what later will be a residence place for artists. That was one goal, and but when we were uh, doing that project, I was cleaning up the house, and while when while I was cleaning, um, I selected uh, some elements out of that uh, place to replace into another place. So the idea was that we make for one hand a sculpture of the house, and for the other hand that we put out uh, out the elements of uh, like pieces of furniture, pieces of uh, clothes, uh, elements which were still hanging, and uh, to select uh, objects um, to give the new context. What you, s what you see here is like uh, a shelf that is uh, almost falling apart. Uh, these are the shoes of my grandfather. Uh, there are uh, objects what he made uh, um, and what was important in this for these elements is that for one hand that they are very specific um, and the way how we install it is just a bit above from the ground so actually they uh, goes away from the object itself uh, because of the fact that we bring it in another position but the fact that we just hang them uh, they become also uh, not directly objects like what we have in daily life that we are standing around. Uh, and this is what you see here uh, as an installation uh, out of a large project, actually. Okay. Maybe, Peter, you can say something about your work, since you're here, too. Um, well, what, what we see here is basically two tracks um, in my practice. Uh, one is, um, the, let's say, the painter, um, the canvas, the painting, the canvas hanging here. My aim with those paintings is to actually bring together uh, a field of representation 
and abstraction in one. So that you come into a moment, you come before or into a moment where the image we see here can be seen or can fall into the dimension of representation, but also immediately in the dimension of abstraction. So it can flip both ways and it has this moment of it can be everything. The way I, I conceive, like I construct these images is uh, really coming from uh, taking a lot of photographs, uh, snapshots of situations where I take away the, 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 let's say the narrative of what is recognizable reality. So I take away um, angles, I take away um, things we can directly uh, identify. So I, then I come to a picture which is manipulated into its negative. So there's a lot of kind of manipulation towards an image which I see as a kind of zero degree image where those both uh, kind of sections, um, representation and abstraction, come together, merge together and can exist as one. Um, then we have the, 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 the marble piece which is uh, again a kind of answer to my fascination with time space because there's no time and there's no space these are one thing and but it's a complete formal other answer it's um, it's something which is um, a huge fascination for something which is bigger than us which is um, history time uh, which goes beyond our thinking and it's a fragment of it it's a very small fragment of that kind of dimension which is in front of us and relates to that dimension and it's it's something that i want to bring back this kind of ungrasp ungraspable thing to the moment of here and now again another time moment so yeah these are the two okay there's also an artist we didn't talk about which is francis alice which is quite a well, very well known Belgian artist who up until this point actually didn't really want to be part of a Belgian group show <laughs> and now is which I think is interesting maybe because of me I don't know but it's just that uh, he is now and it's also interesting because what also Peter emphasized and Geert also and what I also emphasized with this element of the real of course is also the case with Francis Alice in that sense he's no stranger to where we come from. Literally to the point where it's used, where, it's, where, where the, the, the abstracted image is actually used as a color chart nearly in the small paintings, which you have a specific objective uh, as an object on the wall, because they also work with the idea of structuring, the idea of colors and light, but even up until the point where it's directly on a newspaper. And there is also an image where a part of the actuality is sort of blocked off by the situation. I thought that was also quite interesting to have a work like that next to a work like The Panic Room, where Eric maybe and Boy can say, or Boy and Eric can say something about. Talk about The Panic Room. Okay, I will uh, talk about The Panic Room, also about the paintings. First, about the, the panic. The, the dark room where you can see it's an older work. I think it's 10 years old. 10 years old. It's uh, just in the beginning. It's a black space. It's called Sit in Black Space. And then you have the sculptures, the brain of the panic zone. The idea is that you can uh, sit down and that the, your eyes adapt to the blackness and that you see black in black. And the, the walls and uh, everything is like matte and the sculptures are like um, reflecting, uh, like a uh, car spray uh, technique. The idea is that um, this is an evolution who came out of the panic zone, which is uh, uh, another work of me, wi which I produced before. Um, it's a very anecdotal uh, situation. My mother died. I made a big circle in a block of clay and then pushed the black hole into it. 
This is uh, the evolution on the panic zone, which is the middle of this uh, panic zone. Uh, but everybody knows uh, uh, the moment uh, when he enters a panic zone, then he has to uh, use all his talents uh, to uh, keep yourself in balance. So it's a, a very uh, collective item. Everybody uh, has this kind of panic zones. Uh, and uh, is also mostly able to come out of this. Uh, it's like uh, personal treatment. Uh, yeah, the other works. Uh, so I have uh, one of uh, those ones upstairs, big blue one. Maybe uh, the people can go a little bit more on the side that everybody can see them. Um, the idea is that uh, in here I have a white line, here I have a black line, here also black line. Uh, this is in uh, the layer under this layer, white, black, black. It's called polarization painting, uh, which is a common uh, subject if you put on the television or you come out of your house. Polarization is increasing everywhere. So um, <coughs> this is a reflection of the real uh, thing who happens on a political field mostly. I make also a lot of uh, conflict paintings which uh, where I form uh, groups of color who are have a relationship together, which form a conflict position towards the other groups of color. Polarization painting, conflict paintings, noise paintings. Say something about his work. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a, a bit difficult when they're upstairs. Yeah. So. I mean, just try to. Yeah, what I try to do with my work is I want to create an object that is more part of life that you're living with, that you would use, like even for saying it, that you would use a suit, you wear a suit to ornament yourself. And for me, it is important that a work um, is something that's more than just something that is framed with an idea or a concept that is real. It is something that we we unpacked, we put it on a wall behind us. The upstairs, the metal pieces, if you have seen them, they they play with a trompe l'oeil, with a trickery of perspective. And they give you this depth. Um, the, the, these are the small ones that I have upstairs, but the bigger ones, they pull a wall in a direction that one wants. And like Luke says, with the magnets, you can turn this around, you can give this weight within space how you like it. So when sitting in a desk or something, and there's this, this piece behind you, it will push over you. So it's in this unspoken force. It is how we use our language, how we use uh, even how we agree on, on value of things. Um, this I, I want to give it back into people's hands, not as an as an sort of a, a cleanness of an artwork that it's f uh, only fit to put into a space and that you look at it, but it's um, as a function. But the moment you take it off a wall, you put it back in a very uh, neatly case which is very sharp made like almost like a, a gun holster or something it is again something abstract it is something that is beyond um, its function it can be anything it could be flipped over turned around the next time it's another story it's another use for it um, yeah this is a bit advanced. great so you understand my drift right in terms with the real because you heard it from the artists themselves now because Nothing falls out of thin air. I mean, there is a, a clear, experienced element that plays out in all these positions, and this, the, and then, and also, I also want to say a bit more about the, the position of Hugh Mace, which I think is a very underrated artist still, so far. There are beautiful pieces you will see, which are pieces from 1965. I mean, very early on, where he has made in layers of lace, which are circular forms in the space, and behind there, there's a black light. Now, he always told that me that that had to do with the, indirectly, it had to do with his fascination with the red light district. That's what he told me years back. But they're beautiful, abstracted pieces. I mean, 
I've showed them for the second time because I also showed them in another show I curated, the very first one, Trouble Spots painting, which I did in, uh, with the NICC in collaboration with the Museum of Contemporary Art in 1999, where there were also in the vicinity of Helio Tizica and Gerhard Richter, and uh, this was a sort of sort of experimental research in terms to see what the boundaries are of painting. I mean, in terms of two-dimensional proposition or in terms of a spatial proposition, which is actually some a constant sort of fascination I have because painting, although I'm quite a traditional painter, you could say, painting for me is not only just the painting. It can be several things. Uh, a movie can be painterly made, a photograph can have painterly qualities, and even uh, a performance can go as far, because you, what you're talking about is clearly also nearly an element of performing, taking it from the wall, changing it onto a flat surface and a wall surface, and all these things come together. So this, these were all the ideas in a nutshell to come to this show, and I'm actually really happy with the show because on the floor plan uh, it looked smaller once we came here, and this is of course also a problem always with doing an art show. It was, the space was much more generous than we thought. So there was the chance to hang it with, with even space, with a lot of space, a lot of air between the works, which I actually like because that also sort of emphasizes uh, and validates every artist in his own right. Uh, also, the, the work of Amade Cortier, the orange one you see, was for me, for example, a surprise to see that. I mean, if we would hang these works, we also deliberately made the mix so that, for example, the old work of Gaston Bertrand sort of comes into a definite dialogue between Van Snick, Boy, and Raoul, and all those elements. Uh, that, 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 that makes it interesting for me, then, as a curator to have that experience. In that sense, it's an artist, I mean, installed show. It is not a show by an art historian. That is a clear and definite difference. So an artist will always depart from the visual, which I always think is important, which I also think a lot of curators don't do anymore, which is actually a shame, because you can do a visual show with a visual clear understanding and the concept, because why couldn't you? Uh, but then again, I don't want to uh, take away the job of a curator. That's a definite, different other proposition. So the experience is actually paramount in those, in the, those. And I hope that you will enjoy it. Thank you.